Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden, and this is the Top 10 Marvel Fan Capitulations. So today we have another Top 10 that was a Patreon request by Jeremy Renfro. I forgot how Jeremy phrased this request exactly, but the idea is he wanted my views on the biggest moments in Marvel's history where they basically gave up and changed their minds on behalf of fans. Essentially, the bigger the change Marvel had to make away from their own ideas or behavior, the higher it deserves a spot here. Now obviously I have no crystal ball that allows me to divine the motives of editors, executives, and managers over decades of corporate history, but it was surprisingly easy to pick out moments in Marvel history where fan desires certainly seem like the overriding factor in the decision making made by the company. It should be noted this is a measure of the size of the capitulation, not the valence. In other words, while I think some of these were or are positive changes for the company, Others were terrible decisions that only made things worse. I'm not really judging these changes by their placement here, more just commenting on how big of a change I think they are, for better or worse. I will talk about my feelings about all of these, but just because something is high on the list doesn't mean I think it was a bad idea. That's worth saying. With all that in mind, let's get started with... Number 10. The Return of Jean Grey the first story of Jean Grey becoming the phoenix, going dark, and eventually having to kill herself to stop her uncontrollable power from wiping out everyone was a tragic, memorable story that gained a lot of traction with fans and critics alike. The whole thing was like perfectly recreated in X-Men the Animated Series, and the influence of that story has gotten so strong that it's pretty much what people think of when they think about Jean Grey. It's been weaved into her character in a big way because of this, and upon bringing her back, I don't feel the character was ever quite the same. Resurrecting Jean Grey clearly wasn't planned, as it meant major retcons to establish canon with the Madeline Pryor character, and put Scott Summers in a very questionable light to say the least. Marvel never really addressed this either, preferring to ignore the problem and just focus on the fun of reuniting the X-Men. That's okay, it was an obvious move towards bringing back fans and trying to appease those who wanted her back and didn't like her dead. But because of this, the character was put into an endless cycle of dying and returning, and served as an early example, setting the stage for Marvel and DC to basically do the same thing with just about every other character they have. It fits for the Phoenix motif, sure, but it has made her character very pointless and predictable ever since then. This one is rather low on the list because it's hard to parse out Marvel's desires from those of the fans. It feels very much like an editorial decision more than one made at the behest of a mob of fans, and I imagine at the time at least some, or if not many, of the fans were happy to let the death of Jean Grey stand as a powerful moment in X-Men history. But you can tell Marvel also did this because they knew it would work, people would be excited to see her return. Whatever you make of all of this, it's not the worst example of Marvel catering to fandom, but it did feel like it was worth mentioning here. Number 9. One Moment in Time and Renew Your Vows I've talked a lot about One More Day before, but haven't ever actually bothered talking about One Moment in Time. A useless, lifeless attempt at a retcon that, if you ask me, failed to address any of the central problems behind the story of One More Day. Nothing really happened to fix this unpopular move within the Spider-Man community then, and when it comes to people like me, One More Day remains a sore spot in modern Spider-Man comics. One Moment in Time did address some of the problems behind One More Day, shifting the story away from Peter making a rather literal deal with the devil to something along the lines of Doctor Strange making a weird spell. Color me utterly unimpressed. The continuity is still a mess, and Marvel still feels pathetically afraid of a Spider-Man moving forward in any meaningful way beyond the most boring and safe situations. One Moment in Time tries to fix some of these things, an obvious recognition that the community was angry and upset with the original story of how Peter lost, well, everything. But it doesn't go all the way. It's an attempt to tweak, alter, and adjust the story in an effort to make this bile more tolerable but it didn't work. But the attempt remains a great example of how Marvel was so confident about something and caved very quickly over it. Proof positive that fans like myself were not happy with the vague attempts at reconciliation in one moment in time. Renew Your Vows, much like One Moment in Time, is a halfway measure to try and get us to shut up about the regular Spider-Man and all the problems with him. 
It's a move for appeasement towards some of the older fans, but really just anyone who knows Spider-Man beyond the most basic concepts of the character. I'm robustly on the side of the fans on this one, obviously. This is a big part of Marvel's current ideology with Spider-Man to this day, and it's a very frustrating aspect of it. It would be higher on this title, but the fact of the matter is that Marvel still pretty much gets their way with Spider-Man. Fans have gotten small measures through titles like One Moment of Time and Renew Your Vows, but for whatever reason, Marvel still remains firm that Spider-Man cannot be in a committed relationship, or anything beyond the most basic superhero. There is hope, though. There's another superhero out there that's made an extremely successful transition into becoming a family man. The very thing that we've been saying they could and should have done with Spider-Man for years now that Marvel thinks would never work. The success of this and Renew Your Vows means that the issue isn't about to go away anytime soon. It should also be noted that for the first time in almost two decades, Disney has a financial stake in Spider-Man on film, and that's kind of a big deal when we consider the most recent adaptation of Spider-Man very much includes a Mary Jane. If Marvel ever finally abandons the disaster that is One More Day and just fully undoes that retcon, then it will be the biggest time a stupid idea from the company was defeated and would actually deserve to win this top 10. That hasn't happened and may very well never happen. Unless that day ever comes, these attempts at compromise are just that, relatively low on the list, but still a good example of Marvel really pushing for something that fans have really successfully, to a degree, pushed back on. At the end of the day, I had to consider stuff Marvel was really confident about and had to walk back a bit, even if there were other things that they had to reverse entirely. Let's move on to those now. Number 8. Captain Bucky. Okay, admit it. How many of you completely forgot this was even a thing? When compiling this list, I kind of did. But then I thought about it and realized this was one of Marvel's fastest cave-ins to fan desires in the company's history. Some viewers might even be completely surprised to learn that there was a time when Bucky was Captain America, but here we are. And this isn't some long-forgotten chapter of comic book history either. This happened quite recently. Evidently, the move was unpopular enough or wasn't selling comics the way Marvel had hoped, because the decision was very quickly reversed and never really registered with a lot of fans. Whatever story excuse they used to get rid of Bucky being Captain America, it seemed obvious to me this wasn't their original intention because it all went down way too fast. It's interesting this is one of the few examples in modern history of Marvel walking back one of their character replacements in a major way. For one thing, I think it is because sadly, even though it's not that long ago, we are looking back at a time when Marvel was a bit more responsive to criticism and operated with a less overt corporate agenda. Second, I think a strong case can be made that because Bucky is a white man, they couldn't write off the critics of him being Captain America as those of being racist or sexist. Whether or not they're intentionally using these identity politics as a shield against critics in the modern era is up for debate, but regardless of their motives, the fact of the matter is Marvel is doing this. This is how they tend to respond with criticism to their more recent changes, but they couldn't do that with Bucky, and I think that's part of the reason why they retracted the idea so quickly. Fans didn't take much of an interest, and instead of doubling down, Marvel just gave up. But that is very different to how they handle things in the modern era. I think it was for the best anyways. Bucky was always fine in his own identity as the Winter Soldier. That's who we know him as, and who we've gotten to know and like as a character. It goes both ways, though. Because on the other hand, I do like that in comparison, Marvel did actually follow through when they made Sam Wilson Captain America not long after Bucky. With Sam, it's the same situation, where I think he was always a cool superhero and if not just better in his role as the Falcon, so the move to make him Captain America was equally unnecessary, but at least Marvel did follow through on it. At least they made it a big deal and a permanent, sustained thing with a lasting effect on the comic book world. I like that they followed through on a decision they made. That's something they don't do as much as they should. Bucky is the complete opposite of that. And while I kind of like that he's just back to being the Winter Soldier, and think it was probably for the best, it is an example of Marvel saying they're doing one thing and immediately doing another. No matter how you look at it, I think it represents a major cave-in on Marvel's part, and a very rapid example of one at that. Number 7. The Zorn Incident. <laughs> I don't think I've ever really talked much about Zorn before, so let's get into this mess. 
Grant Morrison's time with the new X-Men brought us a lot of very memorable moments and some pretty essential parts of X-Men history and lore. He brought a cool team together, developed great characters like Quentin Choir, and gave us some really big moments that tend to stick in people's memories, and for good reason. Yeah, genocide! He also gave us Zorn. We are introduced to Zorn as a new mutant, ostensibly from China and otherwise a nice, helpful person. He even helps cure Charles of his paralysis for a while. He's then revealed to have been Magneto all along and has corrupted some of the mutants into following his cause while soaking up power-enhancing drugs. He paralyzes Charles again, lays waste to New York City, and commits multiple acts of genocide, planning to recreate the world as one exclusively for mutants. With the drugs taking away his sanity, Magneto is ultimately defeated by the X-Men and killed by Wolverine after he mortally wounds Jean Grey. Cause you know, she can never die enough, right? Now this might sound like a pretty crazy story, and it is, but in some ways I do appreciate or at least understand it as it exists. It certainly isn't Grant Morrison at his best, and Magneto's character definitely seems at odds with his own self, but it is important to remember this has all happened in the fallout of Genosha's destruction. Imagine you're Magneto, and the entire nation of mutants which you ruled over and swore to protect was wiped out. Yes, a mutant was responsible for it, but that mutant used the tools of man to accomplish it. In Magneto's eyes, the world has declared war on his people, and he lost. Grant Morrison made Magneto into a drug-addicted, former dictator, angry and lashing out at the world, and Morrison did a pretty good job of it. <laughs> he even suggested this might have been all under the control of another villain called Sublime, but at the end of the day, it wasn't enough to change the problem of the story. It merited a fair share of criticism, and while, like I said, I understand where Morrison is coming from, I can't say I'm a big fan of the original story. So in response to the, all the backlash, and realizing this story makes Magneto so unlikable they'd never be able to use the character again, plus, you know, he's dead, Marvel arranged for a series of retcons to do away with the whole idea. Magneto was revealed to have been living in the ruins of Genosha all along, while Zorn is revealed to have been a completely separate version of himself disguised as Magneto, who was disguised as Zorn. It turns out this man was the twin brother of another mutant who also took up the name of Zorn, and he started doing stuff for a while. But yeah, it's the original Zoran that was the one controlled by Sublime and did all those awful things while pretending to be Magneto. Because... Oh, forget it. I'm not going to try and unravel the madness of Chuck Austin's X-Men here. But it was the retconning that really gives Zoran the reputation of being completely unintelligible. The confusion would continue in New Avengers, but that only made things worse. And the best thing now is just to write off this entire character as just being weird. Regardless of how you feel, it was one of the biggest retcons and fan capitulations in all of Marvel history. It makes this era of X-Men all the more confusing and harder for new readers to get. Number 6. The Death of Sin's Past And now we move on to a far worse, extremely unpopular story that never was officially retconned, but secretly was? <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about Sin's Past, one of the worst Spider-Man things ever written that historically I'd try to avoid like the plague. Norman Osborn is revealed to have impregnated Gwen Stacy before her death. It's an insult to Gwen and her important role in Spider-Man's story, but also contributes to the trend of making Norman Osborn way too personally involved in Peter's life, to an extent it almost ruins his character too. I had a lot of internal debate about this one over whether or not to include it, since like I said, it was never officially taken out of canon, apparently. I could have sworn at some point the whole thing was retconned during Spider Island, but I could not find anything to confirm that. So I guess not. I guess this is still technically canon. Luckily, current Spider-Man writer Dan Slott has made it clear he wants nothing to do with Sin's past. And even though he doesn't outright state it, his story of clone conspiracy basically makes Sin's past no longer exist in canon. The two stories are completely incompatible with each other. The way Peter acts with Gwen and her own behavior in that story make it impossible that Sin's past could have ever really been a thing. And as much as I dislike Cologne Conspiracy, I'd much rather have that story be canon over Sin's past. Any day, no questions asked. Dan Slott does nothing else for Spider-Man, and he's done a great deal else. He did a good thing for the character in doing this. Like I said, not every capitulation from Marvel has to be negative. Getting rid of Sin's past, at least at first by abandoning this story and later more subtly through Clone Conspiracy, might very well have been one of the best decisions they've made recently on behalf of Spider-Man. Rarely are such big stories and ideas dropped as quickly as this one was, but the whole thing is so bad you really just have to wonder why anyone thought it was a good idea to begin with. 
Number 5. Heroes Reborn Oh god, oh god, oh god, the pain never stops and will never end. Again, we have another chapter in Marvel's history I'd prefer to just forget about, but I think it represents one of Marvel's worst attempts to cater to fans. Heroes Reborn broadly refers to Marvel's decision to reboot their superheroes in the 1990s. Faced with declining sales, Marvel made a series of catastrophic business decisions that cratered the company in such a big way they had to file Chapter 11 bankruptcy and were forced to sell off their movie rights for many characters. The effects of that decision making are still felt to this day, not just in the obvious ways of competing movie studios, but even in little ways behind the scenes within the comic book industry. Their behavior during this time led to Diamond Comics gaining a near monopoly in terms of comic distribution and print. On the story side of things, Marvel launched a Heroes Reborn line, where characters were completely rebooted and printed in partnership with Image, as part of these business dealings they made. Image at the time was getting really popular, and my guess is Marvel wanted to appeal to the growing fans of that comic book line. Nothing about this worked very well, and faced with a lack of fan interest, the whole idea was completely reversed shortly after, within like a year. We can debate whether or not it is a good thing that Fox and Sony suddenly got access to characters for decades thanks in part to this deal, and I might argue it was a good thing and the only reason we ever got into the MCU to begin with. But no matter how you look at it, the company suffered immensely because of what happened. Heroes Reborn was one of the biggest decisions Marvel ever made, and reversing it was a really big deal that reflected just how out of step they were with consumers back then. The only reason it doesn't top the list is that I feel a huge part of this decision making at the time in Marvel really doesn't have much to do with the fans, and more the desperate acts of a dying company in the midst of what was a really tough time for the industry. The whole thing failed and failed hard, but we almost lost Marvel because of it. That should not be understated. It doesn't get much worse than that, but in terms of fan capitulations, well, Marvel has taught themselves a few times in more obvious ways. Number 4. All New Marvel and Its Deformed Cousins When Jeremy brought up this topic for me to make this video, he specifically alluded to this being an example of Marvel capitulating to his fans. Maybe not in those exact terms, but this is what he was getting at. Initially, I thought he might have been a bit wrong in that assessment. Not that All New Marvel and its similar soft reboots over the last several years haven't been a huge problem. They have, and they are. It's just hard to believe that Marvel does all these things for the fans. That notion that they're doing it for us is borderline insulting. And yet it's true. It's been almost a year since I made a video about all the stuff wrong with All New Marvel and the New 52. In that time, almost every single thing I had a problem with in the New 52 has been addressed, in some form and to some degree in the New 52. I am so impressed with how consistently DC has done a good job at fixing some of their own problems. In comparison, Marvel has only gotten worse. I took a good, long look at how Marvel's been acting in the last five years or so, and I have to say, a huge part of this problem seems to be actually an effort to cater to fan desires and to use certain goodwill people in a way that sells them comics. I don't know of anybody who is a fan of the constant reboots or the weird implications of Marvel feeling they have to replace every Avenger you might recognize, but I think they have found this sort of behavior does grab headlines and the hype sells comic books. And it still does to a degree. They've embraced this so thoroughly it seems all they do anymore is constantly try and reinvent themselves, even though things weren't really all that bad after their initial reboot post Avengers vs X-Men. In fact, that was the one time I feel this all really worked. Story within Marvel had genuinely changed and a shift in the tone of the comics had happened after Avengers vs X-Men. All the creators went to different titles, there was a lot of new stuff they were trying, it felt deserved and a new, interesting time for Marvel. But then they did it again, and again, and again, and again. They were catering to a fan crowd, but doing it so badly and failing to understand what the fans wanted. Marvel is a mess now because of all of this. Trying to nail down one character or story over the last five years or so seems to involve tracking down at least five different separate volumes of different books across different continuities more often than it doesn't. It has become harder and harder to follow, feeding into Marvel's own desires to constantly reinvent itself. Every reboot buries the problem more and more. Heroes are replaced instead of just having writers develop their own new characters to work alongside the Avengers or to learn from them. Or even just to replace them, that's fine, but you have to be more original than just creating a new Captain America again. 
It started out small and without actually replacing the heroes. That's why the first wave of the replacements were at least decent and represent some of the best content the company has to offer these days. Miles Morales and Miss Marvel were never really there to replace the originals, just to serve as new characters with a very different take on a similar hero name. The new Thor never really replaced Odin's son, and Jason Aaron did some really amazing work with her. But over time, we've gotten replacements that never really felt right, and were basically just direct, lazy supplements for the original, rather than creative takes on the new superheroes. Meanwhile, we started to get titles that feel like nothing but fan service to certain segments and factions of the internet. The more you can be, my guess, but some of these titles feel so unfocused and just a weird form of fan service these days that vast swaths of the superhero publication line just aren't for me anymore. That's okay, I don't have to like every story, but it sure feels like a lot of them are becoming lazy, boring recreations of better comics from the past. While so much of Marvel's talent pool seems to consist of Bendis, and a handful of other writers they haven't chased off yet that I feel have also kind of overstayed their welcome. I'm not happy with any of this. Marvel still sells well, or at least okay, but based on the success of the MCU, I would argue they should be doing better, and are relying on tricks and gimmicks just to sell the comics they have. It won't last forever, and even then, just because something is selling well, doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Sure, Rebirth is doing great, but so did the new 52 at first. It's all the more frustrating when we realize that a huge part of this is actually in deference to fans. Yes, they did so much of this for us, and it's really hard to reconcile with that. Sure, some of it has to do with money and their weird corporate agenda decision-making skills, but by and large, this is all in an attempt to make the comics more accessible and easier to read. Try squaring that circle as you work your way through five years of Daredevil comics with at least four different volumes to navigate in the correct order. These stupid reboots consist of some of the worst things Marvel has ever done to themselves, and so much of it was done in our name. Number 3. Marvel Legacy So I'm sure some of you are going to be upset this is here. After all, this is all before our legacy has even hit the shelves. I would agree I was dredging things too soon, except the reason this is on the list has nothing to do with the actual content of Marvel Legacy. That's incidental. I think it's a step in the right direction for the company, sort of, or at least it could be, but it doesn't matter. No matter how good or bad Legacy is, it belongs right here on this list. And the reason I'm sure of that, without having read anything from it, is because the reason Legacy is the number 3 biggest fan capitulation in all of Marvel's history has nothing to do with the actual content of the story, and everything to do with the marketing of it. Though Marvel definitely deserves criticism for all new Marvel and the variants of it, it has worked pretty consistently throughout all of this in terms of sales. In spite of that, over the last year, Marvel has been shown up in a major way by DC's Rebirth. Broadly speaking, they still sell more books, but DC sells on average more comics per title, and even though they publish substantially less books than Marvel, and therefore sell less in total, they are gaining a strong, loyal audience, and the comics are actually starting to sell more as their series get longer which is a very rare and good thing Marvel has not been able to do in years? Decades? Who knows? This sort of thing is unprecedented in comics, and it should not be underestimated. Rebirth is kicking ass right now. More importantly than that, the quality of DC's stories has gone way, way up. The stories are getting better and bolder. The company is taking risks, real unqualified risks, and they're paying off. In comparison, Marvel too afraid to make Spider-Man a dad, seemingly unwilling to focus in on characters their own movie line has spent millions of dollars showcasing, and unable to commit to any title beyond a certain number of issues, just keeps looking like it is falling farther and farther behind. In a clear and obvious response to all of this, Marvel has been hyping up their latest soft reboot, Marvel Legacy. Every single moment of marketing around this thing has a clear central message to it. They're trying to do what Rebirth just did. They're bringing back the Avengers as we know them and like them. They're going to start trying out cool ideas and hopefully try and make a real commitment to one status quo for a little while, or at least a line of changes that we can follow and aren't abrupt and out of nowhere. Hopefully they'll actually avoid doing more reboots after this, and are even claiming they're going to change the comic book industry, like DC very much did a year ago. It's all bullshit, of course. Marvel's practically become the DCEU of the comic book world trying to chase the tail of the more successful company that did it first, 
and already signs are showing the right lessons may not have even been learned by Marvel. I've heard news that Loki is going to be the new Sorcerer Supreme, for example. They can't be themselves for five minutes without going back to their old bad habits and trying something boring, and just another hero replacing another role. I don't think Legacy is going to be the vast title change that Rebirth was, but I could be wrong. Rebirth surprised me in all the best ways, and I hope Legacy does too. Even if it isn't great though, I have a feeling it's a step in the right direction. Bringing back the old heroes, making Captain America not a Nazi, and also keeping all the new, good characters that worked? That's a really good sign, and the first step in bringing back some of the elements Marvel may have been missing for the last few years. It's not going to happen overnight. Rebirth was a rare example of a company really shifting itself in a positive direction all at once, and we shouldn't expect Marvel to change just as quickly. That's unfair. But Legacy is a change and does appear to be a change in the right direction. Given how strongly they were pushing in the other direction up until now, it's a major example of them giving in to fan desires, and hopefully, in a good way. Number 2. The Inhumans Yes, this part of the top 10 is just a solid, concrete block of crazy decisions made by Marvel in recent years. But what can I say? Marvel has been operating almost entirely over the last few years at fulfilling their weird agenda to force us into living out their own revenge fantasy against Fox, leading to an unprecedented era of editorial oversight. We see this as the comics have become a workshop for our testing ideas and experimenting on replacements for certain characters in the MCU. But the worst of it, the absolute most annoying, unbearable part, has to be the way the company has been aggressively blocking the use of X-Men and the Fantastic Four in all facets of comics and their marketing, while at the same time pushing the Inhumans on us as if we were children refusing to eat our vegetables. The great Inhumans push has been entirely a top-down, mandated, executive order. Neither fans nor writers asked for it. Multiple video games have been ordered to remove X-Men or Fantastic Four characters, especially in recent years while the company is systematically avoiding them in merchandise of all forms. There is an active, real effort to make you forget about the X-Men and fall in love with the Inhumans, but you can't force love, and it's done in such an obvious, heavy-handed way that it is completely and utterly failed. The capitulation was not in the Inhumans' push. Like I said, nobody asked for that, and Marvel never assumed people wanted it. The capitulation occurred the moment Kevin Feige was freed from the grips of Isaac Perlmutter's control and the Inhumans movie was delayed, in other words, cancelled. Yes, they said it was delayed, but the second they announced they were making a TV show instead, I knew the game was done. They just didn't want to go out of their way to officially cancel it if it turns out the show is really successful, but I seriously doubt it will be. Marvel has failed to make the Inhumans into the major movie franchise they wanted. I take no pleasure in that. The Inhumans were always good as peripheral characters, but they were never interesting enough to replace the X-Men. So rumors of a plan to exile the mutants off-planet after the events of Inhumans vs. X-Men were clearly abandoned, and Marvel has been basically forced to admit to themselves that no matter what they do, no matter how hard they try, the X-Men are never going anywhere. This was a victory for fans in a vague sense, but also a real lost opportunity. See, there's a version of this story where we could have been Marvel's greatest ally in making the Inhumans movie a thing, and a successful thing at that, not their greatest enemy. If they hadn't done everything in their power to marginalize the X-Men and the Fantastic Four, and instead just focused on showing the fun of the Inhumans, working with them and the other heroes of Earth, we might not have been so hostile about all of this. There's some great work being done in the comics with Inhumans these days. On that side, Marvel's done a great job. Charles Soule had a really good run with them, while the Black Bolt solo series being published right now is definitely worth reading. It would have been a lot easier supporting content like that if people weren't sick and tired of the Inhumans being forced into every single stupid story. If every new character wasn't forced to be an Inhuman while no new mutants were allowed to be created, only killed off. We probably would have been cheering on the Inhumans if Marvel hadn't have created such a hostile environment. And we could have been a major ally in getting the general public excited about them too. But no. Marvel took a side, they turned on the X-Men, and in doing so, they turned on us. Still, we didn't help them with the Inhumans, instead we forced them to cave in on the whole idea. Honestly, lining it all up and looking at all of this, part of me really wanted to make this number one. But the problem is, they still are pushing. The Inhumans will still be forced into stuff, 
The Fantastic Four are basically gone in all media, and the X-Men are still public enemy number one within the company. We've had some pretty big effects on how the Inhumans and X-Men are treated, and as a result, some very big plans from Marvel were uprooted in major ways, on a level that doesn't really compare to a lot of the company's history. But there's one thing in all of it that just wound up being a bigger capitulation in all of Marvel history. An example of an idea at one time Marvel was even more confident about and had to completely abandon the idea shortly after. I am very curious how many of you correctly guessed this one would win before you even started watching this video. Number 1. The Clone Saga This was always a front runner for the top 10. It didn't start out number one, actually, but as I did research and thought about what was and wasn't a fan capitulation, I'm quite confident this is an example of Marvel reversing a decision they made and were really excited about in light of fan demands. The Clone Saga's revelations that Peter Parker was a clone all along and that Ben Riley was the one true Spider-Man was always going to be a controversial choice, but Marvel was once fully committed to making this wild idea a reality and at first, they actually did a pretty good job of it. I think that's the craziest part of all. At the time, this was unprecedented and a very ballsy move on Marvel's part. Throwing out your most popular character and getting people to fall in love with the newcomer was that unheard of and crazy talk on Marvel's part. But the most impressive, insane part of all of this is that they actually pulled it off at first. The whole first chunk of the clone saga and the stuff with Ben Riley wasn't actually that bad and had won over a lot of people. Somehow, the success of that title and the strong sales may have actually been its own undoing. In response to it, Marvel ordered that the Clone Saga be continued indefinitely, and it was drawn out far, far longer than was ever originally planned by the writers. Quality diminished, as it would, given the situation, and ultimately Marvel had to abandon the whole idea, revealing it was really Peter who was the original, restoring him and killing off Ben Riley or something, and then the Green Goblin was revealed to be behind the whole damn thing. And yeah, it stumbles into this inconsistent mess that after a while I just don't care enough to make sense of it. Marvel might never top themselves on something like this, with so much creative force behind an idea being dashed so majorly in such a clear-cut manner. Well, pretty much everything on this list is a form of Marvel sort of renegotiating controversial stories and ideas with the fan community, the end of Clone Saga reads less like a negotiation and more like an unconditional surrender. Whether you like Clone Saga or not, it was a major shift in Marvel's plans and a rather serious change in what Marvel wanted to do at the time. As big as some of the other changes are on the top 10, none feel as big as Clone Saga. It was a crazy time in Marvel's history, and in the end there's nothing else that quite compares to it. Not even all the silly stunts they pull today. So that's the top 10. I will say I was surprised at how much I wound up going towards more modern decisions and comics as examples of Marvel capitulating to fans. But to a degree, that should be expected. The rise of the internet and the growth of Marvel into a globally recognized brand definitely dramatically increased the level of fan engagement, so fans have a bigger impact on Marvel's decisions, and that just makes sense. But when we consider how they've also been operating with this agenda, with regards to their own movie and television studios and their legal deals with other companies, Fans have actually had stuff to fight Marvel over in the modern age that don't feel petty or like nitpicky, but real legitimate complaints and problems with the company taking things too far. Marvel, specifically Marvel and not Disney or the MCU, really need to take a serious look with how they engage with these stories, their licensing, and the fan community. They need to put an emphasis on creativity over branding and brainwashing fans into liking the characters they want you to like. If there's anything I learned from going over Marvel's history, it's that this is not how the company used to function, nor is it how they should operate now. It's one thing to try out new ideas for the movie, that's pretty much why the Disney keeps the comic book line around. That's fine. But what they do now goes too far, and the fact that they constantly are at odds with their fans is not a good sign. That doesn't happen these days with DC. Oh, of course there's people who are going to complain with the company, or who don't like what DC is doing, but by and large, they are working with the fans rather than against them. It does not feel that way with Marvel. What they do now is up to them, but I will say it has been a long, long time since I've been this disengaged with the day-to-day -day publications over at Marvel. Too many of their titles are more frustrating than fun, so much of what they do is confusing and unfocused. 
The only hope I can take in all of this is that I very much felt this way about DC near the end of New 52, and now I think they're doing a great job. Here's hoping that in a year from now I can say the same about Marvel. But then I remember I had that exact sentiment last year with the company, so let's just say I have guarded expectations. It's not a good sign that the most charitable thing I can say about Marvel Legacy is that I hope I'm wrong about it. And that's a bit of a downer note to end this video on, but I don't know what to tell you. Marvel's so frustrating these days, and I have no immediate solution. Did you hear they're making a new LEGO Marvel video game and it won't have any X-Men or Fantastic Four characters? How crazy is that? The LEGO games are all about having every character you can have in the mix, and Marvel can't even let them do it. They suck. Anyhow, thanks for watching this video, and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Thanks to Jeremy for a great topic this time, and if you'd like to have a say in the comic book videos we make, check out our Patreon page in the links below. We do take a lot of fan requests in all forums, though we have hundreds of those. So Patreon's the only way to guarantee your request goes through sooner rather than later. Finally, don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.